good to see you. Yeah, those of you online, it's good to have you with us this morning as well. And uh, here's just a, a good reminder for us. This, this day is the Lord's Day, and all over the world, God's people are worshiping Him and gathering together to take up His Word, to pray to Him, to sing His praise, to encourage one another. We're doing that here. We hope those of you online are encouraged and are worshiping with us this morning. But the Lord is with us, whether we're here in this room, whether we're at home online, um, our brothers and sisters around the world and many other places, the Lord is gathering us together in His name because we're His people. Amen? And we want to worship the Lord the way He deserves because the Lord is worthy of our honor and our praise and the devotion of our heart. And we want to sing the song that's being sung um, to God's honor and God's glory and God's praise. So I'm going to invite you to stand with us and let's turn our hearts to the Lord and let's worship Him together this morning. Just like in heaven, 
Just like the saints and angels do Lord, we pour out our praise to you And all of our worship to you Just like in heaven We gather around your throne of grace And we offer our deepest thanks Just like in heaven Good morning. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Welcome to everyone who's online with us this morning. It has been an eventful week and a half, uh, needless to say. Um, thank you for your patience, and I hope all of you are receiving the communication that we're sending out. It's so important that you're in the loop. If you're not, we need you to make sure that you're getting our emails. It's the best way we can communicate with you. So make sure if you're not getting the communication we're sending out during the week, you email us at office at anchorholds.org to make sure that you're getting it. The middle of a week and a half ago, as many of you know, Pastor Steve um, uh, was diagnosed or started showing symptoms of COVID, and, uh, and that was a, a stinky, <laughs> stinky bit of news. A few days later, Miss Donna started showing symptoms as well. So I think all of you are well in the loop, and I wish I could tell you that he's feeling great. He's not. He doesn't feel good this morning. So um, I'm just going to ask that you keep praying for them and healing uh, as they're going through this, and he would hate for me to even be telling you that because that's just the way he's wired, but the reality is he doesn't feel good. So if you would just be praying for both of them and healing, that would be great. In his absence, Gabe Shababy's here this morning. We all love Gabe and the Shababies, and so he's going to be filling in for us this morning. And uh, thank you, Gabe, for, for preparing and, and uh, making that happen. So communication, I mentioned, there's just a lot going on and a lot in flux. Um, there are other parts of our family, the Anchor family, that are dealing with COVID, and fortunately, no widespread issues here, but just keep uh, praying for everyone and healing. It's just, it's hitting everybody. I think we're all prob probably aware of people that, that have it right now that are dealing with it, so uh, keep praying in that regard. And we're just going to keep communicating as things change. We've, we've pushed off the plan to restart life school for, for children and students for a little bit. We'll, again, we'll keep giving you updates as to the timing all, of all of that. And as far as uh, Wednesday night prayer times, you'll get emails from John Hamilton. As far as any other changes, you'll get emails from myself or Teresa during the week. So just be watching for all of that. Um, today is um, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Uh, every year this time comes around, it's, a, it's listen, Every day is Sanctity of Human Life Day, right? But today is a day of emphasis, and um, I'm thankful that we have a number of people here in our church that are very aware and very in tune to what happens um, in the life and in the focus of this and, and ministering to families uh, who are making sometimes difficult decisions. I want to invite Keisha Klobe up here. And while she's on her way up, we're going to share a video. Keisha is the, on the board of the Pregnancy Resource Center of Walton, which is one of our ministry partners that we support. And this video is going to share a little bit of what's happening um, at the Pregnancy Resource Center. Okay, well, my name is Celine, and this is Nadia. She is five weeks old today. I learned about Pregnancy Resource through... Um, a close friend of mine, Danielle Dunn, um, she was coming and she told me about how they help. So I think I was about three or four months pregnant when I first started coming. Um, and they helped me through a lot. I was going through a tough time. I was at a tough time in life. They helped me make some awesome decisions. They gave me the faith that I needed to keep going. Um, what I like best is that they keep God first in the program. And that, that helps me along. That, that helps me because if you have God first, in my opinion, you can get through anything. And I like how it's a Christian-based program. I like how they help you through. Um, you watch the videos and you get incentives for watching the videos. And not just incentives for yourself, but incentives for new baby. Um, things that will help you along the way. And as you can see, like I said, she's five weeks old now and we still come. And they are still helping us out. They're like a family away from home.
too, just like um, all of you guys probably did. Uh, but God was so faithful to us, and we had everything we needed to be able to take care of our clients, even though we were very reduced in our capacity. And we took mostly only abortion-minded clients. Um, we had about a 180 new clients, and close to a third of those were uh, very abortion determined, but we were able to minister to them, and most of them changed their minds because of uh, mainly because of the ultrasound. Um, we also launched a yes, thank you. We also launched a discipleship program so that if someone receives Christ while they're with us, then we can discipleship, uh, disciple them, because a lot of them don't go to church. They say, about 75% of our clients say that they are Christian, but their church has no relevance in their decision to uh, whether to board, uh, board or not. And a lot of times when they come to see us, they realize that they don't really have a relationship with Christ and they don't really know what that means. So we also have a, uh, we're also getting a classroom ready for car seat safety, birthing classes, things like that. Uh, we launched an abortion recovery group uh, for women who've had abortions and they wanna work through that. Um, and I am, you might remember last uh, January, I told you that we were, uh, we got a new 4D ultrasound machine that is the same as the hospitals have right now. And that was just a gift from the Lord. Um, we got that through a grant. We hardly use grants at all. We're, we're totally people and church dependent, but we got um, a grant and we got that for free. They actually upgraded it to what the hospitals have. So uh, we have that now. And so that the good news about that is women who come to see us don't have to go to Monroe if they're in Loganville to get an ultrasound, which is very, very important because a lot of times they don't have transportation and they can't make it to Monroe. So. Um, that's a huge thing. And the other thing going on, the last thing is that we are researching um, getting a mobile unit for uh, like a van that can go out to places like Social Circle and other places that don't have a pregnancy center nearby because a lot of women in our Monroe Clinic actually walk to the clinic because they don't have transportation. So um, I wanted to share with you just two reasons real quick why we do what we do. Um, one is that 36,000 unborn lives were aborted last year in Georgia. 36,000, just in Georgia. And half of those, this is an amazing statistic, half of those were repeat abortions. 70% of the women choosing abortion, as I said, identify as a Christian. 76 say that church was not relevant in their decision-making process. And 75% were aborting only because the baby would interrupt what was going on in their life and or stressful or financial. Um, less than 1% of women actually abort for rape or incest. So the other reason we do what we do is a little more personal story that I wanted to share with you real quick um, because this is kind of a unique story that happened this year. Um, a 26-year-old woman called us inquiring about a free ultrasound. She had gone to Planned Parenthood that morning to get an abortion, and thank God they told her she could not get an abortion because she had had an ectopic pregnancy, uh, and she could not, and they could not see her, and she was going to have to go get an ultrasound. So Planned Parenthood, the abortion clinic, actually looked up free clinics where you could get a free ultrasound. And since we can offer free ultrasounds because of your support, um, she came to see us and we gave her a free ultrasound. And um, our nurse manager, Laura, said when she uh, was helping her through the ultrasound, she could see the walls falling down. And she said that she, the ectopic pregnancy was so difficult that she hadn't allowed herself to connect with that baby. But when she saw her baby on that ultrasound and the baby was um, healthy and moving and everything was fine, she said that she knew she couldn't have an abortion from that point on. So that just seeing her baby and connecting with her baby like that through that ultrasound, that is what made the difference for her. So as I close, I just wanted to uh, appeal to you all because what we do is try to help your neighbor just like God asks us to love him and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And those are the two most important commandments. And we are asking you just to take one of these little baby bottles when you go out. Um, they're on the tables out there. They have not been touched by human hands. We sanitize all of our bottles and then I put them out with gloves. So don't hesitate to not take one. You can also give online 
at PRC Walton, which is Pregnancy Resource Center of Walton. You can also give online. Uh, if anybody has any questions about volunteering or just anything about it, always feel free to come talk to me. Also, uh, Chris Marsh uh, was wanted me to mention that Friday, the um, March for Life is going on, so if you want to participate in that, it's downtown at the Capitol right before noon, and uh, it's just usually a really great event. Um, they have really good speakers. Um, so I just want to say also thank you so much to the elders for letting me have a few minutes to speak, and um, also thank you all of you for your support, whether it's a dollar or because you, you can put cash in here or check in here or coins in here. Um, and bring that back over the next few weeks and leave it at the front desk up there and we will pick that up. But thank you so much for your support because thank you Anchor for your support um, because we could not reach out to these women and help them without your support. So thank you for your prayers and any anything you've done to help our ministries. We love Anchor Church and we appreciate it from all of us at the Pregnancy Center. So thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, Keisha. Stay here for just a minute. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray. If you guys want to go ahead and stand, we'll, um, we'll pray. And the praise team's on their way back up. Thank you, Keisha, for everything you're doing and the Pregnancy Resource Center. It just hit me 36,000 abortions a year. That's 100 a day. Uh, um, thank you for the difference that you're making and, and, and the marshes and everyone who's involved and, and focused on this. It's just a huge deal. To talk about it one day a year seems kind of short, doesn't it? Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessing and the privilege of being here as your body, as your children today. Father, thank you for the Pregnancy Resource Center of Walton and Keisha and the board and all those who volunteer and serve who are part of that team and all of the various um, uh, organizations that are, that are like uh, the Pregnancy Resource Center all over this nation, all over this world that are ministering to, to women and to families who are, who are struggling with in their own hearts, and their own minds, um, difficult decisions. And Lord, we know that uh, the children in their wombs are, are created by you and for you, that you have a purpose for them. So Father, we just, we just ask that you would, in your own sovereign way, reach into the hearts of those, of those women and of those, even of those men, of those fathers, and Father, that you would um, speak to them and remind them of who you are. Father, that you would even draw them to yourself as your, as your children. and Father, just change lives through, through these ministries. Father, resource them, give them, and use us to resource them and to give them what they need so that they can be effective. And uh, So, Father, we thank you for this time again this morning. Thank you for the praise team that's here this morning. Equip them, speak through them as they lead. With Gabe this morning, God, would you give him clarity of thought as he, as he speaks to us this morning? God, we just love you. Thank you for the privilege of being here. We pray for Pastor Steve and Donna, for our family, for the Hadleys and those who are all dealing with COVID this morning. Would you just reach into their bodies? Would you just heal them this morning? We pray for that. So, Father, we thank you again for your love and your grace in our lives. We come to give you praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Sam. 
I go, hand of God, my defense by my side, as I rest, breath of God, fall upon, bring me peace, bring me Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace, and we are thankful today for you. And uh, Jesus, we we know that you're Prince of Peace, and we take you at your word uh, when we see that in the scriptures revealed of you. And we've experienced it in our lives, Jesus, in so many ways, but we want to walk even more in your peace. Um, We want you to rule even more of us as the Prince of Peace. And Jesus, we, we say that and we ask that not just for our own good, but also to bless others around us so that Christ may, or those around us may see Christ in us and they might experience your peace and be drawn to you uh, for life. And so uh, as we worship today and as we hear your word, we're grateful um, that you have for us what we need for today and whatever we may be facing tomorrow, um, you'll be Prince of Peace tomorrow as well. And we do pray now for Gabe, And we pray for ourselves, Lord, also that we would have ears to hear your voice today as your word is open to us. May we be faithful to handle it rightly. 
and may we be obedient as we hear it and then walk out today taking it with us wherever we go. We pray all of this for the honor and the sake and the glory of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks, guys. Thank you for leading us in song. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Philippians chapter 4. That's where we're going to be this morning. I hope, you're, um, I hope you've come expectant. Obviously, you come here because you're concerned about your soul and your spirit and knowing God and growing in eternal things. So... Um, This is not a, 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 a trivial thing that we do here. This, is, this has eternal weight when we gather as God's people and we worship an eternal God. So I hope you come just with joy and um, an intentionality and a hope to hear from God this morning. Why don't we pray one more time before we dive into God's word. Lord, we need you. Holy Spirit, we depend upon you right now. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and you would transform us and you would do uh, spiritual work. It's impossible for us to do this on our own. It's a, we are absolutely impotent when it comes to this type of thing. We are, our hands are bound, but Holy Spirit, you do the work. And so we pray you would reach deep into our hearts and you would speak to us and change us. And we pray in your name. Amen. I, wanna, I do want to, again, just say hello to everybody online. Thank you for being with us. And um, again, we're in Philippians chapter 4. And this morning, I want to uh, talk about the Christian's portrait in restless times. What a Christian looks like in restless times. It's felt pretty restless lately, hasn't it? Can I get an amen? <laughs> yes. In a lot of different spheres of life, it has just felt restless. I think that's a great word, right? From health stuff to government stuff to the stock markets to everything, it just feels wonky and restless. But what is a Christian supposed to look like during these times? And Paul gives us a great portrait, a great painting of what our lives ought to be uh, marked by, characterized during restless seasons. Philippians is a very appropriate book for this because the whole context of Paul writing this is he's in prison. That's not very fun, right? Talk about restless. Um, there's some struggle and strife, and we're not going to unpack all the details of this context from the actual book, but there's some struggle and strife within the church, there are people outside the church that are um, glorying in their shame, is what he says. Um, and then on top of that, there are false teachers. Uh, a lot of scholars say it's the Judaizers again, rearing their ugly head. They're showing up, stirring up more doubt and strife in the church. So it's just a restless, uh, tumultuous type situation. And that's where Paul is writing this letter. It's a very restless time. But in chapter 4... He charges the church. He's talking to the church here, and he's charging us, here's how we ought to hold ourselves. Here's what a Christian looks like during restless times. So if you have your Bible open, chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 4 and read through verse 7. <clears throat> so it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Some other translations say, let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul is going to give us three attributes of a Christian, of this portrait, 
And then at the end, he's going to top it off with a promise. So three attributes and then a promise. We're starting in verse 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And it's a command to the church to lift your eyes above circumstances. The church is in a restless position here. And yet Paul is charging them, despite the circumstances, rejoice. You lift your eyes above the circumstances. In Ephesians 1, you don't have to turn there, but Ephesians 1, another one of Paul's letters, he prays this for the church at Ephesus. Listen, he prays this. He says, um, I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. Verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? It's a different type of sight. It's a sight that doesn't fixate on what's going on around, but it fixates on something greater, on a greater source. And Paul is calling the church to do that, to fix their joy upon a foundation that is never changing. It doesn't erode. It doesn't fluctuate like circumstances do. He says, don't put your, don't rejoice based on your circumstances. Because honestly, the church of Philippi had very few circumstances to rejoice in in this current situation. There was a lot of restlessness. Paul had real chains. Paul had a real threat of death upon his life. And yet he, as a leader in the church, was saying, fix your eyes, not on the circumstances, but on something more solid, something that doesn't erode. And what is that? He says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. This is not some sort of ethereal concept of positive thinking. This is not hyp hypnosis. Just, you know, close your ears and eyes and just ignore everything around you. But he's calling them to fixate their joy, to find their joy from a solid source, the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And sometimes what we need to do as the church in the midst of restlessness is we need to just refix our gaze on the Lord. Do I need to remind us this morning? I think I do, because I have to remind myself that God is immutable. God is unchanging. Let's just take a second and let's, because some of this is like joy in the middle of restlessness. What are you talking about? Joy in the Lord. Let's, why don't we remind ourselves who the Lord is? Psalm 102 Listen to this. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you forever." God is immutable. He does not change. How can you rejoice? Because God doesn't change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He was the same, you know, two months ago during election mayhem. He was the same, what was it, February of 2020 before COVID started. He was the same then. He's the same today, and he's going to be the same tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. Listen to James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You can find solid joy in a God who never changes. He does not fluctuate. He does not vary. He does not change. He's not only immutable, let's fix our joy a little bit more here. He's sovereign. Psalm 33. The Lord thwarts the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart 
from generation to generation. Psalm 115, verse 3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. February of 2020, our God was sovereign. Today, unchanged, our God is sovereign. Tomorrow, God will be sovereign. And into infinity, there is not, I love R.C. Sproul, there is not one maverick molecule outside the jurisdiction of the sovereignty of God. C.H. Spurgeon says, there is not one splash of mist against the side of a steamboat that does not find its orbit in the sovereignty of God. Oh my goodness, rejoice in the Lord. Because no matter what is surrounding you, you can have fixed joy in a fixed source. He is good. He is gracious. He is immutable. He is sovereign. And I'll tell you right now, the government and health and wealth make very, very bad gods. Amen? I, don't, I can't tell you how many people I've told that to the past like three months. They do. They, they make very, very bad gods. They fluctuate, they deteriorate, they're not solid, they waver, they fail, they fade. But for the Christian, our joy is grounded deep and firm on the bedrock of God, who is Lord over all surrounding circumstances. He is sovereign. See, our joy is not rooted in circumstances. Our joy is not rooted in a position, like a certain position that we're, we're waiting to fall into. Our joy is rooted in a person. And it's a person who never changes. He is fixed. He's not like the ocean, right? You go out in the ocean, you like feel some kind of stability like this, you know, and then you get out a little farther and you realize you're not in control, right? And you're like, Ooh. he's a rock. And we stand on him and it's fixed. I have to ask this question. I was just thinking about this this morning, but <clears throat> as a Christian, we have, to, we have to gut check ourselves. We have to check our hearts. You say, Gabe, how can I rejoice when there's all this stuff going on around, around me? And I just want to, uh, let me just take one example. If the election had gone the way, if it didn't go the way you, you voted, I'm not asking that, but if, if the election had gone a different way, would you feel grounds for more joy? Because if so, you need to repent. That demeans our rock. That demeans the sovereignty of God. That demeans the sufficiency of God. That demeans the God of heaven and earth who is in control infinity ago and is in control infinity into the future. But if you at one moment find your joy in something that is so volatile in this world, you need to repent and you need to refixate your gaze on the God who does not change. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, again, I will say rejoice. Well, first, I want to hit that word always. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's not seasonal. It's a call to constant joy. Listen to Paul. And if you have your Bibles, do you all have your Bibles or digital, whichever one? Philipp uh, Philippians, go to one, chapter one. We're going to stay in the book. I don't want you flipping outside the book. I don't want to get us all confused. We're going to stay in the book. So Philippians one, look at verses 18 through 20 real quick as I read it. <clears throat> um. Uh, so it, it, it's like the end, tail end of 18. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored, listen, in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's saying, if life awaits me, I'm going to rejoice. If death awaits me, I'm going to rejoice. No matter the circumstances, always. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord, always. Flip over in the same book, Philippians 4, chapter 4. Look at verses 10 through 13. Paul says this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity 
Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned, listen, rejoice in the Lord always. I've learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Rejoice in the Lord always. It's not contingent upon what circumstances you deem favorable. It's contingent on a person, and he never changes, and we can stand upon him. This is a restless world, isn't it? Augustine, many of y'all have heard this quote, our hearts are restless, amen? This world is restless, amen? But Augustine finishes, and he says, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. That's the Christian life. It's being able to walk through circumstances, eyes fixed upon God, and at rest, no matter the circumstances around me. And then Paul says this to finish verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And what that alludes to is Paul is saying, in a future mindset, no matter what's to come around the bend, remember, this guy's in prison. The threat of death is upon him. But no matter what's around the corner, again, I'm going to say rejoice. It doesn't change what comes tomorrow. I'm going to fix my gaze on God. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to put on my shoes. I'm going to get ready for work. I'm going to hit my knees. We'll finish with prayer in a a few minutes here. But I'm going to pray. I'm going to refix my affections and my gaze upon the one who doesn't change. Again, I will say rejoice no matter what is to come. Is this you, Christian? Is this you, This ought to be the people of God. This is a great witness to a world in chaos right now, isn't it? To find a people who are so at rest, so filled with joy, and they're going, what in the world? Did this guy get a pay raise? Did he, you know, is he just like completely immune to to COVID? You know, does he know something about the government stuff that we don't know? No, it's none of that. It's that we have a living, sovereign God. And I will rejoice in him. A good friend of mine, he got COVID really bad a couple weeks ago. And uh, I, te- I've been te- I texted with him off and on but through the whole thing. And um, one day, I guess it was like day 10 or 11 or something like that. He was like, I feel awful, but I- I'm slowly recovering. And he said, God has been so good to me. Oh, that's great. Rejoice in the Lord always. I feel like warmed over casserole, you know? I feel awful, but God has been so good to me. That's a testimony the world needs to hear, to see from the church. Y'all know who Corey Tinboom is. Um, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but her and her sister um, were put. Um, in a, a concentration camp uh, in the barracks for females. We have a picture of that, I think. It would look like this. Uh, horrendous. Um, during World War II, and um, in the barracks, uh, you know, there were scattered straw for people to kind of lay on, but it just smelled absolutely horrific. Um, they would cram them all into these, these bunks and, and just kind of hope that they survive as, as they could. But her, Corey and her sister, um, Betsy, uh, got into one of these bunks. And when they were there, suddenly Corey uh, stood up and she, she hit her head on the cross slats above her bunk. Something had bitten her leg. Fleas, she cried. Betsy, this place is swarming with them. Descending from the platform and edging down a narrow aisle, they made their way to a patch of light. Here, and here's another one, Corey uh, wailed. Betsy, how can we live in such a place? And then Betsy started to pray. She said, show us, God, show us how to to live in this place. And um, it took Corey a moment to realize that her sister was praying. Corey, Betsy then exclaimed excitedly, He's given us the answer. 
before we asked, as he always does, in the Bible this morning, where was it? Read that part again. And so she flipped open to 1 Thessalonians, and it says this, um, giving thanks. It says, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And then here's what Betsy says, that's it. That's his answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we can do. We can start right now to thank God for every single thing about these barracks. You see that picture? Give thanks to God for everything in these barracks. And then they start to go through this list of things. Thank you, God, that she was able to smuggle in a Bible was one of them. Thank you, God, that we're stuffed in here with all these people because we can actually share the gospel with more people. And then eventually she gets to the point where she goes, thank you, God, for these fleas. Thank you for the very crowding here since we're packed so close that many more will hear. Oh, all right, Corey said. Thank you for the jammed, crammed, stuffed, packed, suffocating crowds. <laughs> thank you, Betsy continued on serenely, for the fleas and for, but that was too much for Corey. She cut in on her sister, Betsy, that's way, that, there's no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. Give thanks in all circumstances, Betsy corrected. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. Fleas are part of this place where God has put us. So they stood between the stacks of bunks and gave thanks for fleas. Though on that occasion, Corey thought Betsy was surely wrong. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let's keep moving. The Lord is at hand. Do not be, oh, I'm sorry, uh, skip verse five. We're on verse five. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonable be, reasonableness be known to everyone. And I like the translation that uses the word gentleness. Let your gentleness be known to all people. This is another feature on the portrait of a Christian. So the first one is joy always. The second is gentleness to other people. What is Paul hitting at here? This joy, this steadfast, immovable joy that is founded on who God is, is revealed in our gentle attitude towards people. This is a mark. This is part of the portrait of a Christian during restless times. Stay in Philippians with me and just flip over to chapter two. Gentleness to all people. I want to highlight this with a couple, couple quick verses. In chapter two, verse three, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of of other, of others. Look at uh, chapter two, verse fourteen and fifteen. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked, twisted, restless generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Look at chapter three, verse eighteen. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. That's a picture of the gentleness, not just towards each other, but even towards enemies. And then the capstone of this illustration, what, what a Christian is supposed to look like during restlessness, flip back to chapter 2 and look at verses 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Let your gentleness, this is part of what a Christian is marked by, gentleness to others in the midst of restless circumstances. This is not from the flesh. This is not common, and this is not easy, and it's in very, very short supply. We are arguing about everything. We're arguing about masks, no masks. Is this correct information? Is this misinformation? We argue about politics, social media, who's got the most power. We argue about color of our skin. We are, you know, argue about whose fault is this and whose fault is that, all these types of things. But the Christian is not that way. 
We are called in restlessness to be so fixed in joy upon who God is that our gentleness is known to other people. What a great testimony to a restless world. Man, that guy's just nice. What's his problem, right? (laughs) Wrong side of the bed that guy woke up on. But it stems from a joy that is not contingent on circumstances. Once again, this is a great witness in our day. And some of y'all may say, Gabe, I want that. The circumstances around me are just kind of tumultuous. It's just frustrating sometimes. And I get upset about things. What do I do? How do I live like that? How do I live a life that is gentle towards others? Well, Paul first tells us what not to do. Look at verse 6. Don't be anxious. That's the worst thing you could do. Don't be overcome by anxiety. Y'all, that rings the bells of Matthew 6, right? Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, he says, don't worry about anything. Worrying never solved anything. Who, who by worrying, Jesus said this, who by worrying added one day or one hour onto his life? Anxiety, anxiousness never solved anything. It's an, and what anxiety is, it's an, it's an unrest. It's a restlessness of the soul. It's a strain in the soul. And here's where I think this comes from, okay? I think anxiety finds its roots by just an inordinate preoccupation with surrounding circumstances, I think the more we just fixate on the surrounding circumstances and, and, and not upon who God is, it breeds anxiety and unrest in our hearts. And we're just we're worked up constantly about things. And the worst part of anxiety that I think we all could admit is that it stems from a place where we just realize I'm not in control. We're just grasping. I'm not in control. I'm not in control. And so what do I? I'm just anxious always. There's no rest. There's no peace within me. This is not part of the portrait of a Christian. And again, I call to repentance. If you you live in constant anxiety, it doesn't mean that we don't get upset or frustrated. But if your life is just plagued by anxiety and you're a Christian, repent of that and refix your gaze on God. Because what anxiety does is it casts doubt upon God. I can't trust you. I'm not in control, so I can't trust you. That's what anxiety says. And this is not a portrait of the Christian. So Paul says, let your gentleness be known. How do we do that? Not by being anxious. Here's, what he, here's the answer, though. But in everything, this is verse 6, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here's what's interesting about that part. Look back at verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. But then in verse 6, he says, let your requests be made known to God. Yes, life has burdens. Yes, upsetting things happen. But we are to unload those burdens onto the sovereign shoulders of a good God and not onto people. That's how you can be joyful is because you're not taking your mess, your burden, and laying it on people. Instead, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, we're going to God in complete dependency and in prayer. Make your requests, your burdens, known to God. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burdens upon the Lord. Cast your cares upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. Yes, God hears, he cares, he works. Lay your burdened soul before God in prayer. Bring your burdens to him. The Lord is near to all who call on him. That's Psalm 145. And so we are not a people in unrest, but we are a people who are dependent. When things around us are in turmoil and we feel burdens upon us, we go to God. Let me ask you a question. In all the restlessness that's been happening in our culture, all of us have have been hit by it in some way. How much in prayer have you been? 
Have you been a person of prayer, of dependency, of leaning upon God, of saying to God, God, in this, in this situation, you can, but I can't. I'm dependent on you. I, I, I do feel uh, powerless, out of control. Things are out of my control, but I come to you, a God, the God who is in control, and I lay all things at your feet. How much in prayer have you been over these past few months? I hope a lot. And I hope it continues on in our Christian life because part of the portrait of a Christian when things are in turmoil around you is that we are a praying people. We are a dependent people. I love the analogy in scripture about Jacob where Jacob wrestled with God. I think last time I was here, I I talked about this. But when Jacob wrestled with God and Jacob said, I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me. And God touched his hip, popped it out of socket. And the rest of his life, he's leaning, right? And at that moment, that's what Jacob needed. He needed his pride just dashed. And you know what? That's a great picture of prayer, of depending upon God, leaning upon God in all things. Go to God in thankful, honest, bold prayer. And in the election, in your family circumstances, with COVID, with work, don't be filled with anxiety. Let's be steadfast, dependent, thankful people in prayer. And here's our last verse. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything in prayer, supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then verse seven, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we've had the three uh, uh, characteristics of this portrait, right? We are a people who, are, who rejoice at all times. We are people who display gentleness to others. And we are a people of prayer. And the promise that comes as a cherry on top is that God will give us his peace. The peace of God will guard you. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. And sometimes we think of peace, we think of tranquil lakes, right? 72 degrees, lemonade, <laughs> maybe a cheese pizza, <laughs> or a hot dog, that'd be better, huh? <clears throat> But peace is not merely the absence of conflict. That's impossible. That's an impossible feat. You know, all those, like, what do you wish for in the world? World peace. That's, and it's impossible. There's not going to be that type of peace. This peace of God is an inward state of rest. It is a resting in God. Anxiety is unrest. Peace is is rest. And the peace of God is a resting in God. It is the ability of the church to say, all is well. When God is on his throne, all is well. We can say that every single day. When you wake up tomorrow, when, when you know, uh, restlessness of, of health and wealth and politics, all these things, you can l- lift your eyes and go, God is on his throne. All is well. When Jesus is Lord, we sang that song just a minute ago, King of Kings forevermore, all is well. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a a peculiar peace for the Christian because it's not just circumstances are falling in line. This is the peace of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And what is that peace? I think Romans 5.1 says it the best way. Therefore, since we have been justified, uh, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what this peace is, where it's grounded? It's grounded in the cross. It's grounded in the blood of Christ. It's grounded in the greatest battle that was ever fought, but the victory is fixed, the battle is won, and God's people, his church, cannot be conquered by death, by hell, by Satan. The main issue is fixed and done. And you know what we can say as a church? Because of the gospel, not because of anything we've done, we can say, all is well. I told my wife this the other day. What's the worst that can happen? I can die. Philippians 1, what does Paul say? He goes, man, I want to die, right? He's like, I want to go be with Jesus, but right now I need to stay here. This is a peace. This is a rest that the world does not know about. It's sad. 
we're not going to get to, I wish, I, you know, we continue on, but at, at the end of this paragraph, Paul talks about taking this peace out to the world. But it's a, it's a peace that the world doesn't know. I, I work in, um, in Decatur. And there are, there are a couple of yards. They're just laughable to me. I mean, it's just hilarious. I mean, like, I know we get excited about certain things, but like, anyways, so you, you drive through these, these certain routes to get to work. And I'm telling you, yard signs are like, I mean, that's like gold out there, man. They're just, but this one yard, I'm telling you, it had like 12 yard signs. Okay. I mean, like candidates names and thank you for this and candidate this and candidate this. this, this. But you know what that's a sign of? It's a sign of unrest. It's a sign of grasping for peace. That's what that is. When someone has such an innate, uh, uh, just uh, uh, voracious thirst for a political party to come into power so that they can receive peace, they're going to be disappointed. The peace of God is a peace that lasts forever. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And the Christian, the church, knows rest even now. Do you have rest, peace in your heart? Even in the midst of all this? You should, because all is well. At those moments when you're washing dishes at the sink, or you flip on the news, or you, you see something on Facebook, or you're at work and just some kind of, you know, you just feel that pressing of unrest, you know what you need to do? You need to think back at the cross. And you need to remember all is well. My soul is purchased. Death has no more power over me. Sin has no more uh, 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 power over me. I can no longer be condemned because I am in Christ. This is a rest that the world does not know about. But they do know, or they need to know. Horatio, um, I can never remember his last name, Spafford, um, Many of y'all know this story. Uh, he was a, a real big in real estate, all these type of things. Went over to the States, left his family behind, sent a, a telegram to, for his wife and his kids to come after him. Uh, he figured they, they could use a vacation. It's time for them to kind of reunite and, um, and be together for a little while. And on the boat ride over, the, sink, the, the ship sank in the middle of the ocean, and all of his children died. His wife was saved, and she wrote him a letter, and when he got it, all it, all it said was, saved alone. And he realized that his whole family had died except for his wife. So he got his stuff, he gathered them together, took a boat back across the ocean, was heading home to Europe, and when they got to the place where the ship sank with his children... The, the, uh, the, the captain of the ship he was on said, this is the exact spot where the ship went down. And moved probably with a lot of emotion, but a steadfast joy in a sovereign God, he took a pen and began to write a song called, It Is Well. When peace like a river attends my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. That's the peace of God that is found in Christ Jesus for the church. And so when you flip on the news this week, or you look at Facebook, or you hear something that says, you say, all is well. God is in control. God is sovereign. Let's wrap this up, and then we're going to close with a quick time of prayer. This peace surpasses all um, <laughs> human understanding. It towers above the reach of man's intellect. It's a great witness during this time. This peace guards the heart of the Christian. It's like a shield. That's the word he uses. He says guards. It's like a garrison. Um, it's almost like a castle built around us or we're, we're held in it. And in the disquiet of a world, our soul is lifted above it because we have this peace. So let me close with some questions. Do you have this peace? Do you have this rest in God, seeing him as sovereign and unchanging? Do you trust him? Do you trust God? 
That's a very basic question, but do you trust him? I'd like for us to close um, by doing what Paul is calling us to do here because these are days where we can feel restless and anxious. But instead of anxious, why don't we pray? Can we do that for a few minutes? And I encourage you, after we leave this place today, to pray more. To fix your joy on God. To not be stirred up in unrest, but to find rest in the peace of God that is in Christ Jesus. If you're able, would you kneel with me? I'm going to come to the front row here and kneel, and I'll just lead us through a few things that we're going to pray for collectively. If you're at home and you're watching, if you want to kneel in your living room or at your kitchen table, wherever you're at, if you can kneel, If if you can't, then stay seated and we'll pray together. But let's go to God in prayer um, and bring, bring a few things to him. And then Matt's going to come and sing and lead us in a song. If you've been, <clears throat> if you've been anxious these past few weeks and months, if your thoughts have been just stirred and troublesome, and there's just constant fluttering of your heart and anxiety in your stomach, and you're constantly asking, what if, what if, what if, what if? Why don't we pray first and bring those anxieties to God, bring that unrest to God? Pray for that. Pray, do that before the Lord right now. As you do that, would you repent of that anxiety and at the same time pray, oh God, restore faith, restore trust in my heart that I would fix my eyes on you. Pray for peace in your heart. Pray that the gospel would be the foundation of your peace, of the peace of God. And as you pray that, just celebrate Christ. Tell God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood. Pray that we would be a people who rejoice always, no matter the circumstance, and that we would be a people who trust fully in the sovereign goodness of God. And finally, pray that we would be a people of prayer and that our lives would be a living testimony, just vitality, life, a testimony of the goodness of God in our lives, the rest that we display in our lives, the calmness, the gentleness that is known to others. So pray that we'd be a people of prayer and that we would have a living and effective testimony among our neighbors and our friends. God, we trust you. 
We love you. We worship you. God, you're on your throne. All is well. We will rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We can rejoice in you, Lord, because you are enthroned. You are King of kings, Lord of lords. You're not taken off guard. You're not frantically pacing heaven, wondering what's happening, but you are trustworthy. And we say as a church right now in our hearts that all is well because Jesus is Lord. All is well. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you stand and sing with us?
Father, there's a lot going on around us, and this week is a significant week in the life of our country, and so as Gabe has already shared for all the things that, not just um, in this bigger picture of our nation, but just in our lives in a very personal way, God, um, there's stuff, and that stuff can be so paralyzing and can get all of our attention. God, would you remind us of those words that we just sung? Would you remind us of the word that that Gabe just shared? It's well. It's all good. It's all good. God, we know that you're sovereign, that there's nothing that has caught you by surprise. There's nothing that's going to happen this week that that you haven't laid out in front of you that you can't handle. You can handle it. So God, we, we trust you. Would you help us to put our trust and our faith in who you are, who you have promised um, to be. Father, we thank you for that. It's your na- in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, praise team, for this morning. Just a quick update for all of you uh, as we've been trying to uh, inform and keep you in the loop of the pastor's search. We had an incredible time yesterday with Chris. If you saw the video we sent out over the past few weeks, hopefully most of you saw that. Um, Chris Gaither and his wife, Shan, were here with us uh, yesterday, and we had seven hours or so <laughs> together, uh, the elders, a few staff members, our wives. It was just a great time of fellowship and, and continuing to get to know one another and, and asking questions and digging a little deeper. Um, not a quick, I, I don't have a lot to tell you as far as the next steps. We'll be debriefing uh, over the next couple of days over that time and, and walking through what the next steps are. Uh, but we're encouraged and we're prayerful again as to how the process is moving along. So thank you for all of you who have continued to pray. We hope the video was was informative and, and gave you a little bit of insight into how things are moving along. And we'll shoot something out again uh, this week to tell you more of, of how the process is going and what the next steps are. So we're thankful that the Lord's worked to this point, and we just pray that the Lord will work in Chris and Shannon and his family. You can be praying for them specifically. His kids are kind of in the loop now, uh, some of them, <laughs> and you can imagine that change is hard uh, for anyone, so be praying for them as we go through this. I'm going to pray one more time as we leave. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for all of you who joined us online. There is, again, the informa- ways that you can communicate with us. Uh, as we as we continue to move forward. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, one more time, we just thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. We thank you for your word be- being proclaimed. We thank you for the gospel that changes lives. So Lord, would you work in us this week? Would the trust that we place in you be a, a testimony, be a light um, to others around us that need you? So Father, we pray for that. And we just thank you for the peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Would you guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus as you promised. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today and allowing us into your home and life. Maybe something touched your heart or there's something going on in your life that we can pray about. Or perhaps this might be the most important day of your life and you made a decision to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Whatever it is, or wherever you are in your spiritual walk, we would love to pray for you. And you can send those prayer requests to us at prayerline at anchorholds.org, and we'll connect with you and meet you right where you are. We hope today has been a blessing to you, and that you'll make the decision to join us again next week. We look forward to seeing you then.